Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. I've got some good news and some bad news. The bad news first? Okay, well, it is the last episode of season seven. The good news is it's the questions episode where we get to answer all of your dinosaur questions. Hello, everybody. It is the best episode of all series because it is the questions episode. That's right. I am sat here opposite of the internet with your favourite paleontologist with a podcast. Maybe if you don't listen to some of the others. Don't stop. Let's not be diplomatic. He's our favourite. It is Dr. Dave Hone. Hello again. <laughs> <laughs> I've got five pages of uh, questions and I've edited them down and it's two and a half thousand words. So... Uh, we're going to. D- we're going to have to start instituting rules at some point of the length of question because. No, no, I, I whittled them down. Obviously, thank you so much for sending us your questions. They mean the world to us and we do absolutely love them. I thought we'd start off with one which has only just come in. He just sneaked in under the um, last minute line. And this is this is from Gutzer, who is a long term supporter on Patreon. You can support us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. If you could give the paleontology fields NASA's budget or consolidate it into an organisation capable of carrying out billion dollar incentives, what would you do with it? And don't just say buy yourself a really nice house. Um, I've muttered about this before and I wrote an article for The Guardian years and years ago where I made the slightly tongue-in-cheek argument that all the research money in the world for science should go to paleontology. And the logic for this was if you're doing something like the Large Hadron Collider or you're studying black holes or you're looking at crystalline structures or new technology in x-rays or l or panda breeding habits or any of these other things whether you do that this year or do that next year or do that a century from now it's just, it's the same science but paleontology is entirely reliant on fossils which are constantly eroding and being destroyed and if we don't collect them they're gone forever and we may never see that species again therefore what we should do is spend all our science money digging up all the fossils now and conserving them long term and then we've got the infinite amount of time to do as much research on them as possible i see it also archaeology see also technically ecology because so many species are dying <laughs> won't be right there. now right <laughs> I did say it was slightly tongue-in-cheek. But honestly, yes, I mean, you wouldn't want to ditch everything else. But yes, if you handed me a billion dollars for paleontology, I would build a series of connected, preserved, um, you know, climate-controlled museums, which were going to be, you know, as far as we could tell, capable of preserving important specimens for thousands of years, certainly indefinitely, and then go and spend as much of the rest of the money as possible digging things up to put in them. Um, And that is honestly the way you should do it with that kind of ludicrous sum of money Excellent. but it's not going to happen <laughs> well, d- never say never however never if, you, if, if anyone is listening who fancies giving me a billion pounds to set up my own museum and go and dig up I don't know what NASA's budget is I think it might be more than a billion oh it's, it's, is... I'm sure it's I'm sure it's in multiple billions yes so um, this is from Ed Krupski I recently read an article on Ars Technica that talks about Parasaurs he sends a link now to be fair I haven't sent Dave the link did you say Parasaurolophus no 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 about pterosaurs oh pterosaurs sorry yes Yes. the question i wondered on as i read about the lsf which is the laser simulated fluorescence fluorescence yes yeah yeah has david used lsf much or perhaps worked with other colleagues that have used it also how do you feel about the article that you haven't read in general (laughs) thanks for that (laughs) <laughs> no, not the questioner, Izzy, for going. How do you feel about an article I haven't sent you a link to that you haven't read? I'm not sure if I. I'm not sure if I did send this to you early because I did send no. you a list of questions, but then more came yes, in. Yes, that wasn't so, on it. Okay, because um, ar- I know about that article because it came out like two days ago, so I haven't looked at it yet. Um, I know about LSF. I've, I've reviewed one of the big. Pa- in fact, I've reviewed two papers on it as an academic referee. Um, it's another methodology of surface scanning. Um, I was actually speaking to some colleagues about this recently, and they had some problems with it. In in terms of getting the balance right with the usage of it. Um, okay. So you basically the risk is if you turn it up too much, you burn the specimen, which is bad. That's the danger of lasers. You know, yes. we, we, we all know they're dangerous. From what I've seen, I'm not sure it's generating that much more super interesting and super detailed information that a lot of other techniques don't. And it seems to be really expensive and difficult and almost no one can do it. And if it's really expensive and difficult and almost no one else can do it, it doesn't generate that much more information 
conservation and it puts the fossils at risk. I think we need to spend some more time getting it right before we start blanket slapping it on everything. Um, but certainly, I'm pretty sure the article you're referring to relates to a paper that recently came out about foot structure and linking that to takeoff in water. All that data was already available. That paper was two papers. I, I, I wrote the review for this and one of the people was a good friend of mine who, and, I, and I told him this. So I'm, I'm not revealing any great secret. I told him this to his face and went, I don't know why you published that paper. It's two papers welded together. There is a paper going, we found some more webbed feet in some pterosaurs using this and we've worked out how pterosaurs might take off from water if they had webbed feet, which is interesting, but we already know that they had webbed feet and we've already measured the webbed feet of several of them. So you could absolutely do that calculation without any of the LSF data at all. It was an, it was one of those where it was an opportunity to do that work, but in no way did LSF generate the data to do those calculations. Okay, and and don't switch it. It's very important. It's a bit like a tanning booth, LSF. You've got to be careful. It might damage your skin. So, Tone Kristin, it's a good question. The ocean-going pterosaurs that could be days or weeks in the air without landing, how do they sleep? And we've had more questions about how pterosaurs sleep as well. So w- do we know anything? We've I had questions about whether they hang upside down like bats. What's what's going on? Do they hang upside down like bats? No, that's a really old trope going back to the 1800s when they were seen as being particularly bat-like. They don't have bat-like feet at all. Chris Bennett wrote a paper about this in, I want to say, about 1992. It, it's one of those things. It's like, it should have died long before then. That really should have been the nail in the coffin. It's still coming out. No, they don't hang upside down like bats. Um, how did they sleep on the week? Well, we, we don't know if they could spend weeks or days in the air we infer that they probably did given just how specialized they appear to be for oceanic life it seems very unlikely that they didn't but we don't know and then how did they sleep doing that well we have no idea there's absolutely no way of knowing the obvious inference is they do something like we know a lot of birds do like we know some dolphins do and a bunch of other things like this which is they will probably shut down half the brain and rest that half and then shut down the other half and rest that half it's what i do when you speak yeah it's it's (laughs) but it's speculation based based on very basic inferences of what we know other animals with those kinds of lifestyles generally do. But who knows? So what about when they're sleeping on land and things like that? Because Kevin w- wanted to know, um, could they loaf like a cat or did they look like a wet jacket thrown on the floor? I, it's one of those things no one's looked at. We've got a pretty good idea of how they walk because we've got those walking tracks um, for them. We've got a landing track for one of them, which is really quite nice. It's a shame we don't have any obvious takeoff tracks. Really surprising by now given that we've got a landing track um no one knows uh you know even for a couple of theropods we've got specimens either preserved lying down or we've got this famous resting trace which shows the bump of the pubis hitting the ground there's nothing like that for pterosaurs and they are a very odd shape that they don't obviously fold up neatly or there's a, you know right but a lot of animals you can obviously see well the joints would fold that way and they'd end up into a fairly compact shape and that's generally yeah. how things rest pterosaurs just don't so did they end up horribly sprawled out on the ground very inelegantly like things like elephants tend to or I'm hoping what? they starfished that's what well, I want I want them to starfish and I, ideally what I want is them to be able to lock out their limbs and then you know and, and then basically be like water boatmen on the surface of a yeah. still pond oh, right, yeah. and then right. just be blown around while they snooze yeah but but you know or sleep standing up which we know a bunch of animals do um, mm. don't know um, almost impossible to tell uh, and pterosaurs do seem to have really flexible joints, which you might expect for something flying, but that means that then the part, you know, they appear to be able to achieve a whole bunch of postures that other animals can't. But then whether or not they did that habitually when trying to rest, don't know. We're, off, we're a good list of don't knows at the moment. <laughs> I think I think we'll 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 go to um, we had we had historical cook at historical cook uh, tweeted us um, um, at d a v e underscore h o n e or at i s z i underscore l a w r e n c one are pterosaurs linked to any animals alive today similar nope. how there we go <laughs> sorry that's, it's just the really obvious one no they, they they're all gone they're all deaded and they all and the last ones went in the kt yeah yeah, yeah. Extent. okay so 65 million years ago we haven't seen the flappy flap since um and two how did you and Izzy meet and decide to do dinosaurs and podcasts together we've told the story before but i do like it and you haven't told it i think i always do yes my version of the story is 
because I was more sober at the time. I was very drunk. Izzy and I met while I was doing my PhD and she was doing her undergraduate degree. And um, to save money, I was staying in an undergraduate halls of residence where I was one of the seniors looking after the lovely little kitty winks. Hello. And she, she and I met and got on. Uh, and then I finished, she finished. We went our separate ways. This is before Facebook, before everyone had a mobile phone. I'm, interge- I'm interjecting that he showed me his whip scorpion. Yeah. That is, yeah. yeah. I, I had some I had some invertebrates in my flat, which I wasn't allowed, but no one cared. Um, <laughs> uh, and you know, so before the days, it was easy to keep touch with people. Once you'd done, not everyone had an email address, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, I drifted around the world, etc. Came back. We both entirely coincidentally, basically, ended up at a friend's Christmas party together. And Izzy walked in, and for those who've seen pictures of Izzy, you can't miss her. <laughs> six foot one with spiky white hair across what? the room <laughs> sticks out. It's like I know who that is. So went and said hello. Um, we got chatting. She's obviously doing podcast. I wanted, I had considered doing a dinosaur podcast more than once. We said maybe we should do something at some point. Kind of left it there, and then three months later we're in lockdown. And <laughs> <Boom. laughs> we, we we are bored, and she is unemployed. So <laughs> that's the brief version of it. Yeah, that, that's basically what happened. Exactly like that. And I did arrive at the party quite drunk. So because uh, I'd already been to the pub with other friends, because I was such a socialite back in my youth um so cool that there's the answer to that um and making sure i haven't missed anyone i think i did okay um we're gonna do a non pterosaur question are you okay with that not that the last one was a pterosaur question <laughs> yeah. or, or the first one ex- yeah <laughs> Anyway. This is from Posilutely. What relation is Velociraptor to Megaraptor if taxonomy and genealogy were the same thing? Sort of third cousins or great grand raptors or something else? I ask because I have a toy Velociraptor from the first Jurassic Park film, she still screeches, and my son has a Megaraptor from Jurassic World Dominion, much scarier looking and feathered, and ask me how they were related. If it, if it is Megaraptor, then it's a, then it's a Megaraptor. I didn't know there were any Megaraptor. Megaraptor toys doing the rounds. I haven't seen any. Um, so Megaraptors are an odd group from South America, which we don't really know quite what they are. A number of analyses over the years, including a brand new one out like two days ago. So Darren Nation we've had on before and Andrew Cow, who's definitely been mentioned before, have produced a big new paper on Eo Tyrannus, the early British Tyrannosaur, just the other day. And in it contains a big new phylogenetic analysis. And in that, again, not for the first time, but this is very much the most most recent paper, they recover the Megaraptorid group as being a very odd early offshoot of Tyrannosaurs, in which case Megaraptor has got very, very, very little to do with Velociraptor and other Dromaeosaurs in the general sense of, you know, theropod phylogeny. You know, it's as distantly related to them as Gorgosaurus or Tarbosaurus. Yeah, I very, very indeed. Um, even if Megaraptorids aren't Tyrannosaurs, I'm very much on the fence because I have no dog in this fight and I really haven't read the literature, but it's seems to be an increasingly common result in analyses. Um, they're definitely nothing to do with dromaeosaurs. This is the problem with the word raptor. Uh, everyone now thinks that raptor basically means dromaeosaur or part of that kind of dromaeosaur truodonted early bird group. And it just doesn't. The word raptor turns up on stuff all over the theropod tree. It doesn't mean like velociraptor or microraptor or any of those kinds of things. Um, so yes, it would be an extremely distant seventh cousin. It's from a branch much much earlier offshoot of the theropod tree for a very different group so yeah that's that's rubbish that's like saying you know what relation is our queen to well i suppose um do you want to start this analogy again and then cut the last 10 seconds <laughs> no i don't i don't mind i don't mind stumbling dave i don't need to know everything i was gonna say queen anne and then i was like that's a very good analogy but nobody's going to understand that because you know no nobody one really the, understands the, the, the genealogy exactly of the, the hanover you know the very for that matter, exactly. Yeah. So, so I won't say that for that reason. I will just say it's like me and somebody I've never met whose wedding I've never been to. So there you go. Uh, the second part of this question from Posilutely is what what's hetero about Heterodontosaurus? Is its teeth? What's homo about us that makes us Homo sapiens? Not a fallacious question. I honestly want to know. Heterodontosaurus means it's got different teeth in its gob. Yes, that's quite literally it. So Heterodontosaurus has different differentiated teeth Mm. Um, so it's got in particular this famous big fang near the front of the jaw that's actually on the lower jaw pointing up and then some fairly more normal kind of leafy shaped teeth slicing
missing teeth behind it. So yeah, it's, it is the heterodont. It is different teeth. Um, the homo for homo sapiens, I don't actually know. I mean, it's an obvious same as. But same as us. Same, same as ourselves, which doesn't quite make sense. Um, yes, not an anthropologist, so I'm afraid I don't know that one. Not an anthropologist either, but I, I would have assumed, and I always have assumed, it just means same as us. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's probably in the context of... There's no heterosapiens. Yes. Um, but but in terms of, you know, Homo is a bigger group. It's a genus. So when you are talking about Homo habilis and Homo erectus, these are things close enough to be the same as us. So that sort of name sort of makes sense. But then because we're within that group, by default, we get the same name, which then becomes almost tautological. Exactly. We are, the, like sa- we are the same thing as the same thing as us. It is inception. <laughs> yes. So I hope that answers your questions. Now, Harry wants to know... I'd like to ask Dave, given his work on spinosaurids, what's the validity, oh my goodness, of Oxalalia? Oxalalia, I think, because it's a horrible name. Yeah, big uh, Brazilian one. I think it's Quilombensis. Uh, I can't even remember the species <laughs> name of that thing. As far as I'm aware, it's currently considered invalid as a genus, as most recent phylogenetic analysis. It's not clear whether it's now synonymous with irritator. Is that me? Uh, Challenger Eye. Really, that that should be my dinosaur name, Irritator Challenger Eye. Or has been amalgamated into Spinosaurus, or is just going to remain unnamed due to its fragmentary material. It's something I've been curious about for a while now. So this is from Harry. Is is Oxalalia? Ali, ah, um, is that a, is that a true spinosaur? It, it, so first of all, it is a spinosaur rhine. That's uncontroversial. It's got the right teeth socket shapes. Um, it is though just a snout. A lot of spinosaur, spinosaur and spinosaur rhine material are just snouts. For some reason, they survive really, really well. We've got loads of them. Um, it's because so they that, don't have much, you know, their lips go, but that's a hard bit. Isn't that yes, what you but said it, in your lecture? yeah, but it, yeah, it, it is an it is a fairly odd phenomenon though that they survive so regularly when so many other bits don't. But that doesn't really matter. Um, is it valid or not? That depends who you speak to. Um, one thing I would definitely say is just because someone's found or done it, either said it isn't or done an analysis, doesn't mean that it is. Like I said, you know, like I've just been saying with the megaraptorids, lots of people have their own analyses and use subtly different things in subtly different ways and get surprisingly different results you know one man's trash is another man's treasure i'm perfectly happy with the idea that it's valid though it's not something i've looked at in detail the last time i looked at it in detail was actually for the review paper i did with tom holtz and i think we provisionally considered it valid then i will freely admit however that there's not a lot holding it up it's just a snout and we don't have a good handle on how much snouts vary but you could call it something separate you could call it spinosaurine in I don't think there's any particular reason to think it's Spinosaurus, which I've seen on the web repeatedly. Oh, it's just Spinosaurus. No, it looks different to Spinosaurus. Whether or not it looks different enough for you to name it is another question, but I'd be very surprised that whatever it turned out to be, that it just happens to be a Spinosaurus that has got to South America. I think that's extraordinarily unlikely, and it is definitely not 100% consistent. So I would say at the moment it either is Oxalia and it counts as a separate genus, or or it's Spinosaurine in debt. It's probably not any of the species that we currently know. We just can't necessarily pin a name on it. But I don't think it's Irritator, and I don't think it's Spin. I really don't think it's Spinosaurus. I, I love the fact that's an Irritator. That's great. Uh, it, it's, it's an Irritator challenge, right? It is called Irritator because it's the annoying one. When the specimen was found, it was bought off a dealer who'd either screwed up the preparation or tried to hold the thing together. And they'd used, like, car body filler repair stuff, like the goo that you mix up and then use to fill in the gaps and metal in your car and apparently just getting it apart without destroying the fossil was an absolute nightmare and so they called it Irritator and Challenger right is for Professor Challenger from the uh, oh, okay. Lost Lost World books because it was a South American big theropod hope that answers your question Harry um, this question is from Matt uh, and it says I took the University of Alberta's free Dino 101 module a couple of years ago and one thing stuck out to me they told us about the two groups now this is a thing that I do on stage 
age. It annoys me so much. The ornithician, the bird-hipped, and the cerician, lizard-hipped, dinosaurs. And they're the wrong way round. They are the wrong way round. Distinguished by which direction the pubis points on the hip bone, in a simplified sense. Then they told us that modern birds evolved from the cerician dinosaurs, which seems slightly counterintuitive. Slightly, it's stupid. Anyway, are there fossils in the record of intermediates between lizard-hipped dinosaurs and modern birds where the pubis is in different orientations or observed to be moving over. So when did this flip happen? Yes, is the short answer. So um, if you look at things like Dromaeosaurus and Troodontids, which you mentioned a few minutes ago, and those things right up there on the line to birds, um, they have pubes that either point downwards or now point backwards. And actually you can look, probably starting with Ornithomimosaurs, but definitely very clearly they're in Overaptorosaurs and to an extent in the Therizinosaurs, so in another pair of groups very close to that group closest to birds they either have downward pointing or backward pointing pubes so it was absolutely a general progression through the more derived saurisians towards birds where that pubis just basically fairly slowly rotates back over a few million years and it happens multiple times in different groups the sort of thing you'd expect uh, to the point that yeah dromaeosaurs have the avian condition and they are saurisian dinosaurs with a backwards pointing pubis it's just it's just a nice i mean why it's, it's it's why it, do that because and the naming convention was started 120 years ago before anyone knew that birds were dinosaurs that's why <laughs> it's it's yeah um what i want to know though is how because it is up to us I mean, we don't find them tilted in the ground like that so are there methods what are the methods of how you work out where the pubis bone goes and so how they're walking is it just well that looks right that doesn't look right how can it move how, what you mean the orientation process? of it exactly because exactly. it's fused to the others fair enough so there it's a bit go. like it's a bit like going how do you how do you know the back of your skull goes there it's like well because it's not supposed to come off so if it has broken off you can, should be able to put it back on and see where it goes i see i forgot that the pubis was actually attached to the spinal cord like that so that... well i mean that so it's not to the spinal collar but the the, okay. the, pu- the pubis is i mean in birds at least the the whole pelvis fuses together so the three mm. bones the ischium the ilium the pubis all fuse together uh, i don't think that's quite the case in dromaeosaurs and now i'm trying to picture a dromaeosaur pelvis in my mind's eye and work out if it's fused or not even if it's not fused and actually i'm increasingly thinking it might not be Mm -hmm. but even if it's not fused it it basically has the the pubis does contact the ilium above and the ischium behind and they have these big flat plates that they contact with so you've basically got a pair of plates at almost 90 degrees and they have to contact the other two bones so the direction of the rod of the pubis is inviolate at that point you know you know exactly where this bone goes and exactly what orientation it's poking in from that um i'm sure it fuses in a couple yeah well i just think maybe they're just really kinked and we just don't No, know that they're, they're not they're not free floating you know most bones really kind of lock together to a certain degree so you, you really know where they go cool so let's go to matt and patty i'm not sure if it's the same matt i should have made sure shouldn't I? this is patty too so this is mainly for patty how accurately can we assess the age of fossils as old as 65 to 120 million years ago i.e can we actually tell the difference between two species that lived say 10,000 years apart in 60 million years will paleontologists be able to tell that for example great danes which i know is a little weird because domestication species boundaries but you get the point and woolly mammoths did not overlap how big a gap do you need before you can say with confidence that two species did not overlap or share environment yes and no is the answer um so under the right circumstances i believe that even going back about 100 million years you can get dating down to 10,000 um, in other words the um, brain will kick in and so the isotopic dating that we use for things like um, um, lead argon is the big one the dating on that can be as good as 10,000 years I think it's really out of my area but definitely like 50 to 100,000 but I think it can get down to 10,000 even that far back if you've got good samples well analyzed the problem is and I'm sure we've discussed this before with a few rare exceptions the types of rock that you can date are volcanic and don't contain fossils so unless you are lucky enough to have volcanic level dated to within 10,000 years immediately above it your fossil layer immediately above that fossil layer a volcanic layer dated down to the nearest 10,000 years and is exactly 10,000 years above your previous one your constraint on your fossil layer is not that good so we might be able to date a volcanic layer down to 10,000 years and then the next one we can date down to an accuracy of 10,000 years and they're a million 
million years apart. So all we've got is a window of a million years in the middle, and we can say above or below within that. Um, so that's why it's a yes and no answer. Yeah, we can get down to 10,000 years if you're lucky. No, it doesn't necessarily translate to we can date the fossil itself specifically to that age. Fair enough. So what is the longest period of time that a single species of dinosaur lived? Don't know. For that exact reason, because dating oh. everything is an absolute nightmare. Um, for, for the, and, and again, dating is complicated. You can only do it on certain things. It's expensive. It has problems with it. You often need multiple different samples. They are often contradictory to each other. Um, and things live very different lengths of time. There, there's a kind of stated general average that species live about two million years. And that appears to hold true of lots of different groups, everything from like mollusks in the sea up to big mammals. Actually, two million years as a ballpark figure is a decent guess and a decent average. But we've got some sharks that are like 20 million years. We've got some very recent mammals which we think appeared and went again in 50,000 years. So that range is colossal. So... Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, right, uh, you know, but this is the... I think this actually almost goes back to the stuff we talked about, social dinosaurs and stuff like this, in that on average we have a pretty good idea of what's going on. But as soon as you try and make it specific, it's almost impossible to know. Most dinosaur species were probably living about 2 million years, and therefore if they're much more than 2 million years apart, they probably didn't overlap. But there's probably some massive exceptions to that, and we have no idea which they are. I think it's very difficult because I don't think we think of species as blurring into each other as much as they really did, much as they really did. Well, and and that. Well, and again, the, the gaps in the fossil record. Again, we, we talk about T-Rex and Triceratops and Diplodocus and things like this an awful lot because we've got lots of them. You know, three quarters plus of dinosaur species are known either from A, one specimen, or B, specimens all collected from the exact same place. Place and you time. Know, what, what yeah. Place and time. And so the range is zero. It's a dot. There's no geographic range and there's no temporal range. They are that point in space at that point in time and that is the sum total of our knowledge of their range and then we've got like oh well so you know t-rex there's a bunch i i've seen them there's some teeth and some isolated big tyrannosaurine bones down in central mexico i have seen them they are indistinguishable from t-rex is that T-Rex? We don't know. They don't have any of the unique features that we use to diagnose T-Rex. If they are, T-Rex has a range all the way down into the middle of Mexico at least and almost certainly further and goes back another million years at least and probably further. If they're not, there's another species we don't know about. And those are the two options and we don't know which of those is right. And so you could argue that T-Rex stops in New Mexico, northern New Mexico in the US or goes deep into the Mexican South. No idea. Fantastic. Right, but, you know, and that's one of the good ones. So, yeah. This goes into Matt and Patty's question three as well. So I'm going to say it. And three? So you just, Come on. I know. Stop asking questions. Uh, OK, but what is our estimates for how much biosphere we have in the fossil record and how much potentially exists? So, I mean, how many species do we think we'll never know anything about because they simply were never preserved? How do, do we have a way of estimating that? And do we have a way to tell what it is likely to eventually fossilise from our own time? That's like four questions. Um, I'll, I'll answer three quarters of them by saying you should really read my book because there's like half a chapter on that exact subject <laughs> yeah. it's, it, it has so many what's issues what's the book called Dave? it is the future of dinosaurs or uh, released in less than a month from now at the time of at least in, August. in about two weeks 2nd of August it will be out in the North America as how fast did T-Rex run that's not just a book plug genuinely I wrote like two and a half thousand words on that subject and I'm not going over it again <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is ah, okay and you can always get it out of the library. You don't have to buy it. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Celine uh, wants to know, it flows beautifully from the last question because she's talking about the book. What chapter are you the most proudest writing? And what chapter as a reader and a huge fan of dinosaurs should she look forward to read? God, I can't remember what's in it at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what what what? Chapter? I I I, ha- I handed the manuscript into the publishers eighteen months ago. I can't I know, remember. What's I know. In it. I know. But people assume I haven't read that it you're since. better. You're, people assume that you're better at uh, remembering your own life. 
Yeah. Rather than yeah. blocking out the pain of writing. So writing David's book. writing another thing at the moment, which is causing him much agony. So the previous book seems easy in comparison. Isn't that right, Dave? Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought writing was supposed to get easier. It's getting much, much harder. But anyway, um, I did really enjoy writing the dinosaur behaviour chapter because obviously that's really my thing. And as everyone who's been listening to this for a while has heard me bang on about, I think it's frankly often done very badly by a bunch of my colleagues. So it's nice to <laughs> set the record straight slash pontificate slash outside of the peer review process where people can't criticise you, tell everyone that they're idiots. Um, I, th- I, th- I think the phrase is dazzle, dazzle. <laughs> uh, but genuinely, you know, that, that was a fun chapter to write. Um, I got to talk about lots of things that I think are really interesting in that. Um, I'm really quite pleased, actually, with the kind of future of research chapter, which I originally thought when I said I was going to write it, I thought, you know what, I really haven't got a lot to say. And then once I got into it, I thought of lots of stuff that I got down on the page and I was really quite pleased with. Um, so, and that's, that's like the penultimate chapter or the, or the last one before, like the kind of coder and conclusions bit. Um, so, yeah, probably those two. Excellent. Uh, she has a question for me, which is, is he after working with David um, for a while now on his podcast? Or this podcast, rather, not his podcast, but technically. Um, have you a favourite dinosaur? Has your favourite dinosaur changed? I can read. I would say, no. Uh, so Tom well, wants well, what to... Was it? <laughs> well, what was it? What does it remain then? Because I well, don't it's know. Probably, it's probably a Bellisaurus still, because okay. why not? Yeah, but you, did, you hadn't heard of that before we did this podcast. Exactly. So it has changed. It's gone from not having one to one that we the one that you learnt about on this podcast. That's a change. But when I was a kid, because I had all the things, I had an ankylosaur, I had a stegosaurus, I had a T-Rex, I also had an ichthyosaur, which is just stupid. So it's changed then, because you didn't even have it. Yeah, but an ichthyosaurus isn't a thing. And if I was honest, it'd be some f- form of agnurinated, would be, or a scantosauriops rigid, maybe. I don't know. I don't like to pick favourites, guys. I don't like it when they fight. I do like it when they fight. What would win with Izzy's favourite dinosaur? Anyway, let's move on. Let, let, no, let's so, have, let's have what would win between a Scansoriopter rigid and an Ankylosaur. Ankylosaur? Unless <laughs> yeah. a Scansoriopter rigid like, used its long incisory tight teeth to sort of like burrow through the Ankylosaur's it, it, eyeball into its skull somehow. It is happens. rabbit of Kaya Banog territory, isn't it? I mean, exactly. It can, it can jump about this far. <laughs> I, I think it would, it would, if it were rather than a fight, some sort of race, I think it'd be an interesting... Because I think it would be a real tortoise in the hair, the Scansoriopter up to rigid and the ankylosaur uh, but the ankylosaur is the tortoise in this case because I think they could go quite fast over a short distance but then they would have been plodding and um, it's kind of up to rigid would have been very fast very quick very darting but need to rest on a lot of trees so uh, Tom wants to know I thought of another question might actually be more applicable given this series about pterosaurs were flying dinosaurs able to survive the cave PG extinction events but flying reptiles not why were flying dinosaurs able to survive but flying pterosaurs weren't why he's guessing it had something to do with diet but would it be nice to hear more details um i can't i doubt diet was anything to do with it um in a, in a general sense what almost certainly did for the pterosaurs is the fact that they were basically big um we do now have evidence of a few smaller pterosaurs getting up to the kt boundary which we didn't have until very recently it was all big ash dark kids now we've got some nyctosaurs and probably some uh anhangarids or even pteranodontids knocking around but we're still talking about two plus meter wingspan animals much bigger than any other bird going along and then you've got things like longer growth periods smaller populations less diversity and all the other stuff which generally sucks um and as we definitely talked about in one episode at some point it rather surprisingly a really neat study three or four years ago every time i say three or four years ago i suddenly think was it 12 years ago (laughs) relatively recently uh showing that actually the birds that did best were the forest small forest dwelling ones that probably could have not necessarily burrowed yeah um, yes. pheasants got, and chickeny type yeah things. got down into you know those kinds of areas and of course these you know pterosaurs were not in that area but in any way shape in or Tom's defence those types of birds are very they've got a very like um, omnivorous diet but it's but it's not the diet which is keeping them alive it is the ecosystem in which they were living and how big they were um, they happen to have a different diet as well um, but again we, we have we 
have ducks getting over the line, so they're quite aquatic <laughs> and probably feeding in water. So um, yeah, but yeah, they also I, like they can eat crusts. You can't feed a pterosaur crusts; that wouldn't work. Um, but okay, I get that. You know, there were some big creatures which did survive. I mean, crocodiles being the obvious. You yeah, know, but uh, because people think of crocodiles as being big. Dwarf, oh, so they dwarf, were dwarf. only the small ones made it through, and then they grew. Well, again. but 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 again, it's it is a false perception that crocodiles are big. We think about big crocodiles, but most living crocodile species are under two meters are adult almost all the caimans and then dwarf alligators and dwarf crocodiles um you know there's more small species than there are big species which actually is the general rule for most things um so yeah there's there's loads of small ones knocking around i don't know the detail of crocodile survivorship across the kt boundary in the same way that i don't know it pretty much anything but it's small size generally is what you really need so basically and the pterosaurs were big you can think of that extinction event like a little sort of filter and anything below a certain size got well, through. more or less i mean again you know sharks did including some fairly big ones you know there are always going to be exceptions to this kind of stuff and, I, and i've said before it's a surprise that some of the dromaeosaurs don't they, they look every bit as bird-like or as well adapted or suited to getting across those kinds of thresholds as the few birds that did but there's also an element of luck in it remember even the birds took an absolute hammering and like 50 60 percent of them went it's not like birds cruised through while everything that wasn't a bird keeled over on the dinosaur side of things the bird took an absolute kicking there's almost certainly a massive element of luck in this you know which forest or which bit of the world happened to have a diverse little group who happened to survive in sufficient populations and were untouched enough and all the rest of it i reckon it was woodpeckers i reckon there were woodpeckers just stored ducks which lasted ten thousand years during the nuclear fallout <laughs> the nuclear winter anyway uh so mike sorry not michael matthew sorry matthew he wants to know is there any evidence that intraspecific fighting among pterosaurs no unfortunately Duh. um yeah don't don't know of any again the sort of thing that probably wouldn't show up um yes plenty of them have teeth but they very few have you know really strong bite power and yeah anyone who's looked at videos or even seen it in the wild of you know things like crows or robins you know absolutely tearing each other apart and will quite happily Geese kill each other and ducks yeah but they, they're not breaking bones and leaving horns in impaled in each other and the sort of things that the dinosaurs do but they're i mean pterosaur bones are so thin and their membranes presumably so delicate that you might expect to see some sort of healing or no well we don't know how delicate they are there's the, there's this idea that like a tear in the wing membrane would would do for them but there's really quite cool footage of bats out there with huge holes in their wings or torn flaps flapping around and they they're struggling but they're getting into the air and flapping around i'm, I'm sure pterosaurs did not just basically die instantly if they had any kind of tear in their wing membrane they're not going to be knocking around for 160 million years if they're that vulnerable um so that's the first thing um and then the problem you've always got with this kind of stuff is you don't know the background you know we could find a brilliantly preserved wing membrane tomorrow with a bunch of holes in it how do you know that was another pterosaur and not a fish or it crashed into something and landed in a thorn bush or (laughs) right but we don't but you know but we just don't know the the few occasions where we've got a good idea is when it's things like tyrannosaurs where the only other big theropod in the environment with big sharp teeth that could leave evenly spaced big scores down bone is a tyrannosaur it kind of has to be um or things like ceratopsians where we talked about this with triceratops you can basically line them up and see that the horns about the only thing which could leave a dent on the head of a triceratops is the horn of another triceratops but you know there's a um there, there's a there's an allosaurus with like a hole through one of its vertebrae and a bit, multiple people have said it's a stegosaur puncture wound from a stegosaurus spike well maybe and it's about the right size and shape but we don't know that it didn't fall onto some weird spire of rock or a big spiky branch and these things do actually happen we and we don't know or, or that it's just a weird infection which hollowed out the bone Ew. um and well right so who knows or it was shot with a cannon well it'd have to be some kind of spear because the cannon you'd expect okay. it to explode yeah. on impact okay, it, it, it need to be a flechette round out of a cannon javelin yeah. javelin there you go um so mikhail wants to know and uh, this is this is nice and nerdy among dinosaur papers i've noticed a common style for displaying overall animal shape and skeleton black body and white skeleton often indicating missing and unknown bones for example figure one of Dave's spinosaurus paper which is available as a link on spinosaurus episode i'm wondering if this is standard practice in paleontology publications did you make up a whole new way of showing missing bones well not me um what's your paper 
He's referenced Yeah. Them. So I think this probably goes back to Greg Paul, who we've mentioned before, and his, when was it, 94 book, Predatory Dinosaurs of the World? That's certainly where a lot of people encountered it, and he'd, and he'd absolutely been doing that for a while and did it in huge numbers for this. I'd be amazed if there aren't papers before doing that, though. Um, it seems like kind of almost too obvious a mechanism of showing skeletons off that I can't believe a few other people hadn't done it. Um, I'd have to go digging through an awful lot of papers. Um, he definitely popularised it and kind of standardised it in the sense that that has kind of become the default way of doing it. As with all things, it has its merits. It has its problems. I think it's, in general, a nice, clear way of showing things. Um, there's always a question about exactly where the bones finish because of course the way people tend to draw these things is they'll tend to draw a black outline of the bone of each individual bone and then colour in the black and now it's like where does that bone actually end because now it's just a white block on the screen but actually if that was traced it's quite possible that the black outline as drawn was part of the bone and that's now kind of vanished thus mysteriously now all making the bone smaller than they used to be and slightly inaccurate and then when you've got people doing things like arguing about which is the longest dinosaur and you're measuring something which is artificially shunted together because the spacing is all wrong and bloody bloody blah, 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 blah. Um, it's fairly standard it's not universal you see other versions of it done I've done I, my first tail paper on dinosaur tails that I did I didn't black it out because I couldn't be bothered I didn't think I'd do a very good job and I was trying to do more of a rough diagram of a skeleton but I did a skeleton without it and you will see them without fair enough uh, we got a question from Ruth back on the pterosaurs unlike dinosaurs there seems to be strong evidence of sexual dimension morphism in pterosaurs how did the male uh, how did the males and females look like good good well done um, you're a woman after my own heart and how do we know that it weren't multiple species rather than different genders well half of that is the same exact same question as we've dealt with before in dinosaurs because we've got the same medullary bone thing we've got the same population thing we seem to have got the same do growth we have trajectory medullary, thing. medullary bone in in pterosaurs well, i think it's known in one okay i mean but they but they should have it they are they are reptiles that need a lot of calcium to lay an egg there's no reason to think they wouldn't do what turtles do what crocodiles do what lizards do what birds do and what dinosaurs do they should be doing it um that there's not that much dimorphism it's the same thing we've got a couple of good examples and now that has immediately become oh there's massive dimorphism in pterosaurs no we got two pteranodon which we talked about in the pteranodon episodes there's not a lot of point talking about that again and the exact same thing applying to darwinopterus this little intermediate taxon from china where we have larger individual individuals with a crest on the skull and smaller individuals without a crest on the skull and we have a smaller individual which doesn't have the crest has a wider pelvis and has an egg inside it well there you pretty go. convincing evidence that that's the female um but it's not impossible that we've misdiagnosed them and that they're separate um we've got things like the ornithochirids um so the big ocean going ones where every single ornithochirid we have ever found has a big crest on its nose all of them it is impossible possible to argue that those are all males or that those are all females and there were males with even bigger crests and we just haven't found them yet so again this and again huge numbers of specimens are known from huge numbers of species are known from a specimen so yes is there dimorphism in pterosaurs yes but the paper i've talked about before that i did way back now in 2010 on mutual sexual selection the paper was at dinosaurs and pterosaurs because almost all these same problems apply every single ceratopsian ever has a, a frill and horns of some description every one of the chirid pterosaur does every tapijarid pterosaur does every ashdarkid pterosaur does um almost every tina casmatid does there's no particular reason to think that females were unornamented though some of them were probably less ornamented than males which is actually what pteranodon has uh, so it's not that females were unornamented males just had bigger crests um but yeah that's pretty much it got kevin kevin uh, who we mentioned earlier but i'm gonna let you have some more kevin good questions dave says pterosaurs could barely keep their heads above the surface when they're in the water. But since their bodies are so pneumatic, wouldn't their forelimbs have enough buoyancy to lift their heads up if they just stuck out their arms straight in front of them? Like, you know, when you do when you're, you've got the float in the swimming pool and you're going yep. across, across the... Yep. Uh, doing legs. Um, 
So first of all, no, we modelled that and it doesn't make any difference. Um, I also tried, or got Don because Don Henderson did the modelling. I also tried him to artificially push the arms into the water. So, you know, your arms would be high, bones would be pneumatic and there's pneumatic things in the wing. And I said, well, what happens if, you know, it would be work to do it. But assume you, assume you could lock the joints and you push the arms down into the water, which of course it puts a lot of buoyancy deep down, which would really push you up and you could like lock your joints so you didn't have to expend loads of muscular effort to hold them there. Like anyone who's been in a pool and tried to hold a ball underwater, you know, that is tough. Would that lift the body up? And the answer is it turned out it doesn't. It just pitches them forward and sticks the head under further. The, the problem that you've got is the head is a long way out on the neck, particularly in pterodactyloids, but even in the ramphorinkoids or, or the non-pterodactyloids, you've got the same fundamental problem that basically they can't recurve the neck in a way that a bird does. You, the, the swan posture that you, you see... S-shape. ...is actually what almost every animal does. It's just usually it's quite small and covered in fluff, so you can't really see it. Even bunnies have this. Even little things, well, no-neck things like sparrows. Even we have it. Pterosaurs basically can't do that. Their head is a... I'm trying to think of an analogy. It, it's a lollipop stick. Yeah, pretty, well, yeah, pretty much. It, it doesn't bend up and back. But, you know, it can bend down, but not up. And so the only way you could possibly lift the head up is to exert all your muscles right at the back of the base and lever the whole thing up, which those muscles are going to get really tired really quickly and then your head's just going to go splosh back onto the surface. And we're talking massive traps if they're doing that, like huge trapezoid muscles to be able oh, to yeah, hold the neck up. Oh yeah, it'd be, it'd be horrible because again, you've got a big lever. Um, yeah. You know, it's quite a long way out, particularly for the pterodactyloids. So yeah, your, your arm position won't solve the problem of the fact that you don't have a very strong neck and your head and neck is basically a rigid spar at least in terms of going up therefore you are basically stuck with your head on the surface well probably just above the surface but again that's really bad if there's lots of waves and wind flapping around uh, now where are their nostrils at this point they're up the side and, and potentially quite high up on the skull but they're, they're not cropped like top mm. of the head and they don't have type things. Well, we don't know if they don't i suppose but you know they're not like again, seals. potentially they could have little turrety things oh, oh i'm sure yeah. they could close their nostrils but again the the, the the concept behind that paper is not that pterosaurs couldn't float, we said they did. Not that they couldn't swim, which we said they did, but multiple people have said we said we did, they didn't, which is not what we said at all. But that if you look at things like tropic birds, which basically struggle to take off from the surface of the water, and some pterosaurs probably could, and even if you ignore them and, and just think about, you know, albatross, and things like albatross, however amazing they are on the wing, when the weather gets really bad, their solution is to land on the surface of the water and sit there and that's how they get through a massive storm something like pteranodon if it's if it's decision or plan is to land on the surface of the water and wait the storm out is stuck with its head almost on the surface of the water and if there's a massive storm with howling gale and wind and water and waves everywhere that's probably a really really bad idea for not drowning and that's what we're talking about. Will they struggle to keep themselves clear of water in terms of basically inhaling a load and potentially drowning if they are stuck on the surface? And we think the answer is yes, because they can't get their heads off it. Yeah, and it does explain why you get so many dead ones in the middle of the sea. Right, unless they're, unless they're good at taking off from the surface, which a bunch of them almost certainly were, they're going to be in trouble. And even the ones that could might be in trouble in bad conditions. Okay, now... Would you rather, because he's got loads of questions here, so we're going to pick between uh, wingtips or uh, legs and hips. Not doing wingtips yet again. Okay, cool. So what was the range of motion of pterosaur legs at the hips? How far open could they spread mid-flight? You mentioned bats are somewhat analogous to pterosaurs since their terrestrial locomotion is on all four limbs. But bat hips are almost backwards compared to other pteropods, tetrapods, sorry, and can easily hold their hind limbs far out to the side. Could pterosaurs do that? I'm still going with the water boatman theory by the way this is my I, I i just saw a load of water boatmen the other day and i thought they look almost exactly like little pterosaurs and you can imagine they, they do look like little body plans of ash dark i'll give you that if you yeah. stick a nose on them and a bit longer wings um where do pterosaur hips go we don't really know calciprees um there's like one really good 3d pelvis and femur from germany and it's a sungaritrid um and sungaritrids are probably not the best model for this because they're kind of weird terrors i mean all pterosaurs are weird but they're potentially 
potentially weird pterosaurs. Um, so it's not very helpful. But in general, they have a pretty big range of motion. Quite what that really means, I'm not sure anyone is certain. There was a paper a few years ago arguing that they couldn't stick them out sideways, you know, pro- properly basically have their 180 Flying degree. Fox yeah, it's like just literally legs pointing sideways. Um, I thought that paper had some massive problems with the way it was written, um, but I think that might be correct. Um, I, for the record, my problem with the way it was written is it said, all these pterosaur researchers have been gotten the legs wrong because they say they can go out horizontally and they can't. And then they cite a whole bunch of papers to say this. And I looked through those papers because two of them were mine. And those papers don't say any of the thing at all. Mm-hmm. I don't know where they got it from. I think there was some specific and careful over-interpretation. Um, most, pe- most illustrations that you see um, in technical papers as well as, you know, paleo art of them, have them at about 45 degrees. So not pointing straight back, not pointing direct sideways, somewhere in between. Probably, I think that's become a kind of default simply because we don't really know. Um, And the thing is, they almost certainly moved in flight anyway. So I don't think any one posture is the right posture. Um, For the reason is that the wing is integrated to the leg and you want to do really cool warping things with the wing. And so stretching your leg out back would change the wing cord and letting your hip go almost sideways would shorten the cord and change the lift structure of the wing and change your lift and doing one leg one way and one leg the other way would totally change the way you fly they're going to be moving their legs their legs are part of the wing um so the resting or normal default glide posture i reckon was probably somewhere in between the two which is roughly where people draw it but again we really don't know and it's one of those things which you can't really work out because we don't know exactly how they're flying we don't know exactly the properties of their wing we don't know how much control they're under we don't know how much muscles is in the leg to control it and what forces they could and couldn't resist so it's a lot of guesswork do you know what else you don't know that's the answer to lev's next question but i'm gonna ask it anyway a question about pterosaur noises sorry if no it's don't know <laughs> like is he i assume that they'd make a squawking kind of sounds not not like not like sounds i make they don't think they could co-host this podcast but they you know i, I tend to think of pterosaurs going Wah! Yeah, you do. I do. But what evidence, if any, do we have about what kind of sounds they would have made? And re- relatedly, it's in pretty much every dinosaur programme ever, including Prehistoric Planet, things like T-Wakes make low growling sounds, the kind of things that big cats make, which seems intuitive because they were huge. But given that birds are dinosaurs, can one extrapolate back and say, hang on, to at least a factor that they might have made some sort of bird-like sound, albeit adjusted for their massive size? Well, we've covered all this before, I'm certain, in at least one episode and probably more than one. We've done rumbling. Terrace absolutely no information whatsoever anywhere we don't even have the one fossil syrinx that we have for the one for Vegavis the, the little Cretaceous bird from Antarctica they are archosaurs um, pterosaurs are archosaurs the same as dinosaurs they've got crocodilian relatives alive today that make a whole range of sounds but they're all what we call closed mouth vocalizations or near enough so in other words n- they don't have lips to make complicated sounds like we do um, they're making growls and hisses and rumbles and roars and probably some other things things as well but yeah. there's no real crocodile babies knowing. outraged cheerleaders oh great well they kind of go yeah oh yeah meow. those two the laser ones well but yeah the, oh, um yes so meow. all of that kind of stuff but we don't know and and for the dinosaurs birds that do trills and whistles and clever noises have very very complicated arrangements in the throat dinosaurs almost certainly don't have that there's no evidence of them having it all the earliest birds so chickens and ducks and cassowaries and rears and kiwis and all of those groups don't have it it's a clearly derived feature we don't expect to be present in dinosaurs so don't expect any of that by default cock a doodle doodling though they could cock a doodle do surely mm. <laughs> and then t-rex yeah we we know t-rex and other tyrannosaurs had um, auditory systems pitched to low sounds we can tell that from their inner ear structure they're probably making low sounds and then listening to low sounds and they're probably going after big things like relatively large triceratops these would still be young animals remember a young triceratops can still be a ton ton and a half it's going to be making big loud it's going 
to be making low pitch noises simply because of that size. Could you work out though simply why small songbirds make those noises, and also things like seabirds, which have a similar, um, you know, um, environment? They share an environment that would have been similar to the pterosaur. Well, yeah, some of it's going to be environmental. So yeah. you know, if if you're if you're a seabird, there's very little in the way. There's either a cliff in the way or nothing, so you can just see. Um, so you're going to tend to be more visual in how you communicate with a lot of things. Whereas if you're deep in the forest, line of sight is almost non-existent, so you're going to have to communicate by sound, at least by sound until something can see you. Um, and okay, there's all kinds of weird trade-offs, so yeah, most birds of paradise are extremely visual, but they still have to call to find each other, and then they go showing off with all their pretty plumage. But fundamentally, yeah, how big you are is going to limit or determine your pitch, and where you live is going to have a massive influence on the kind of noises that you're making, what you're trying to communicate with, and, and how. Okay, uh, theropod arms, let's do Lucas's question. I have a question about theropod arms. More specifically, what were they used for? Dinosaurs like Allosaurus, um, Diphosaurus and Dionychus have pretty long arms proportionally, especially compared to Tyrannosaurids and uh, Abelisaurids. Yet their arms don't reach further than their mouths, so they probably would be able to um, be their primary method of hunting. What are they for? Why did Allosaurus have a huge meat hook claws on its hands if its mouth has better reach than the hands? Why were uh, uh, Dilophosaurus's hands very flexible but not long enough to grab prey before the head but yeah it is it is annoying were they just picking up suitcases all the time what's going on I'm going to be really annoying there's half a chapter of this in my new book honestly almost word for word that's what I've written we all keep banging on about how and, I, and actually I didn't so Meraxes this big new Carcharodontosaurid that came out like two three days ago which has got weirdly short arms for a Carcharodontosaurid and I did a couple of interviews with media people and I said I said the same thing to them which is this same question is that everyone bangs on about how weird it is that T-Rex and Abelisaurs and now Meraxes have these short arms. I don't think that's interesting at all. All that tells you is they're not using their arms. What I think is interesting is what the hell were the other theropods doing? Because I agree with every one of those statements. Their arms do not appear to be... that. They're, they're, you know, Allosaurus has functional arms. They're massive, they've got big claws, there's lots of musculature on them. I, they're a weird thing to try and catch prey with that's then stuck under your body where you can't see with your head and you've already overtaken it. Um, yeah, but why on earth would they have these arms structured like this I don't know and I don't think anyone's ever really looked at it they've just kind of assumed that they're weirdly functional in some way and even the dromaeosaurs which at least can so some of the dromaeosaurs I'm happier with because if you look at Velociraptor they are really big serious claws in a head that's very lightweight with very small teeth and so actually in conjunction or even the claws being a primary thing and the head being secondary it makes sense to me at least but stuff like Dilophosaurus Allosaurus early Ceratosaurs early Carcharodontosaurus all these kinds of things no I, or early tyrannosaurs I'm with you those arms it doesn't make sense why don't you just use the head the arms are a weirdly out of place thing to be doing this with and I don't think anyone seriously addressed that question I mean it might just be things like you know climbing on top of another dinosaur and staying there type thing or climbing in general yeah, that, that's I mean that's been suggested for the tyrannosaurs which is stupid um, it, it's the well it's the same pro, like you know allosaurus these are big big muscled limbs like if these are purely sexually selected and only males need them, females are going to ditch them. You, yeah. you don't want to be carrying around 30, 50 kilos of bone and muscle your entire life for something you never need. They would rapidly reduce, I'm sure. Which is what we see happen in a whole bunch of other groups that don't need them. So what are they doing? I really, really don't know. And I suspect we're really misthinking how a lot of these animals were acting as predatory. You know, we do these complicated analyses of like the hatchet model of allosaur predation attacks, which I don't have a problem with, but it ignores these giant giant muscular arms stuck under the body. What are they doing? I'm, I'm just oh, jumping down onto things. Be my only thing. No, yeah. you're shaking your head at yeah, that. Yeah, right, right. But it, it's, it's a real... It, it, honestly, they've, they've hit the nail on the head. I think it's a massive gap in our knowledge and understanding. And I have put real thought into this over many years. This is a problem which has bugged me since at least I was in China because I started writing a paper <laughs> about it and I realised it was just going to be a weird like speculative opinion piece that no one would ever publish, so I didn't. But I've honestly been thinking about this for like at least 12 and probably 15 years at this point and I haven't got anywhere with it. Could be bow hunting, could be. <laughs> I mean, maybe they were just, they just love playing guitar so yeah. they wouldn't 
to being able to move their wrists like that because they've got carpals. But you know what I mean. You know, I'm, I'm sure they're doing something predatory with them, to be clear. Just really not obvious what that is and how it's supposed to be working and how selection is operating in these various things. And I've come up with no real way of testing it beyond the obvious biomechanical ones of going, oh, well, it was this strong and it could move this fast and it could carry this weight and it would be good at piercing but not slashing. Okay, and now what? Because that doesn't actually get over the hump and you just fall into the trap that we talked about, which I hate, of people going, well, what if it did this? Well, maybe it did, but we need a little more than just what if. You need a testable hypothesis and some kind of data to base that on. And again, like, you know, Allosaurus is a great example. We've got hundreds of Allosaurus specimens. Literally, we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of skeletons of all kinds of different herbivores from Allosaurus environments in the Morris, and many of them articulated and complete and could easily have records of attack marks or pathologies in the Allosaurus or all this other stuff to get a piece together of what they might have been doing. And to my knowledge, it's basically nothing, let alone any of the other taxa. So it just becomes this massive question mark, which everyone will just speculate madly, but it won't actually get you anywhere in terms of working it out. And I think it's a huge gap in our understanding. And we're probably badly mischaracterizing what they're doing. And it has driven me to distraction for 15 years. I'm thinking it's fish tickling. They're trouting. They're getting in the water and lowering their claws in the water and they're tickling fish and then pulling them back really quickly. That is... Uh, we haven't had any Allosaurus fish inside probably, but shh, it'll be fine. Okay, we've got time for one last question. Uh, and this is from Georgia Bat. Uh, I shouldn't say her last name. This is from Georgia. Uh yeah, it's Georgia. Uh, listening to the Protoceratops episode in season two, she gone well back. Blimey. <laughs> the thing is, people find this podcast all the time, Dave, thanks to our lovely listeners who retweet and they share and they leave us lovely reviews with lots of rah, 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 stomp, stomp, stomp. If you don't know what to leave as a review, a few T-Rex emojis is always very popular. So just, just do that and give us five stars. Love you. But yeah, so people are just finding us. They're working their way through. So Georgia has asked, uh, listening to the Protoceratops episode in season two um, had to look up its skeleton to understand what you meant by its paddle tail when looking at their bodies and strong tails I just needed to ask has anyone thought that protoceratops could move like a kangaroo or rabbit using the back legs to jump forward together and the the tail of stability as an Australian when I see the short uh, front and strong back I think kangaroos and wallabies I know the megafauna in Australia did so why not protoceratops Um, a bogan can dream I'm sure there is a muscle skeleton reason why it can't but I'd be interested to no. I don't think anyone suggested bounding in them. The Weirdly, no one suggested jumping much for any of them. I've wondered very vaguely if some of the really small ones hopped. Um, I think there's like one hopping trackway, but it's like two strides, as in it something ran along, took like two little hops and then ran along again. Though again, some very small birds do that if you watch birds in your garden a lot. Magpies. Yeah, but they don't appear to be like habitually hopping dinosaurs at all. In terms of protoceratops, I mean, so kangaroos have massively muscular tails, as I'm sure uh, George is well aware. And if you look at them, you know, they're incredibly strong. And in fact, kangaroos famously are pentapedal. Um, they walk on five legs, except of course they don't because the fifth one is the tail. But if you watch kangaroos and wallabies, um, when they move slowly, this is what they do. They they plant the front legs and the tail down, and when they lift the back legs up to step forward, they're they're tripodal with the tail. And that requires a big muscular tail to be able to balance like that, and then to provide that counterbalance in the air. Protoceratops are just not built like that. And yes, they do have relatively short forelimbs, but not that short. And they do have relatively big hind limbs, but not that big and muscly. Um... Plus, of course, they've got a really big, heavy head. Um, I'm sure Protoceratops was actually quite good as a biped in the sense of if it wanted to rear up and walk around quite a few steps upright, it was probably quite well suited to that. But it, it's not some kind of facultative biped like Cetacosaurs and the earlier little kind of Proceratops. Because there's certain bearded lizards that run like that, aren't there? That, um, you know, yeah, but, but again, lizards often have very short forelimbs uh, mm. and we're, we're really not talking that, that kind of, of level. Cool. Plus, Plus, the, the other thing we actually have, ex- sorry to cut you off, but extremely rarely we have a protoceratops skeleton associated with footprints because you don't normally get footprints in the same rocks that you get skeletons. And there is a set of short trackways that lead to a body in Mongolia. Wow. So we've got it. We've got a, we've got a walking trackway protoceratops, not a hopping one. It's last steps preserved. Quite, quite literally. It's quite incredible. That's, that's, that's jam. 
Grammy, isn't it? That's pretty good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you have d- given us loads of questions. We do have a few more, but I think we'll leave it there. Um, so maybe maybe we'll do a few extras for our patrons. Um, you can find out um, more about us um, at terriblelizards.co.uk. You can um, check us out on patreon.com forward slash terriblelizards. Thank you so much to everybody who supports us. It does make this podcast much more of a viable option for us to do, considering that Dave has so many books to write and I have other podcasts <laughs> and other also so many books to write but not about dinosaurs mine are all about historical fiction for kids Blackbeard's Treasure is out in January with Bloomsbury and you can pre-order that uh, I presume now I don't know uh, <laughs> we managed to pimp your book more than mine <laughs> that is not true we pimped your books loads like every answer to this, this episode was like it's in my book you should buy my book and you should buy his book it's very good so do go buy Dave's book <laughs> uh, yes uh, you can also check out my other podcasts as well uh, Your Place or Mine on BBC Sounds would be great if you give us a lovely review for that that'd be lovely um, and I also do one with the British Museum which is going to be re-released at some point in the autumn called the British Museum Untold uh, but you can go and listen to old episodes of that uh, that'd be awesome um, other than that Dave uh, should we say rah yeah. okay after three one two three rah find my book available in good bookshops and on order Thank you for downloading this episode of Terrible Lizards. To support us, please become a patron on patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. If you can't do that, don't worry. Just leave us an amazing review on your podcast app. Also, you can check us out on Twitter. I am I-S-Z-I underscore L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E and Dave is D-A-V-E underscore H-O-N-E. You can also check out our books. Dave's got a load of dinosaur ones. I've got a load of children's ones. I also do other podcasts as well. Go to I-S zi.com if you have dinosaur questions you're going to want to email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com that way we can answer them in the questions episode i think that's all i have time to tell you but thank you if you support the show already you are amazing we will see you next time